pública. Hello and welcome to Issues and Answers, a production of the Government Information Service. I'm here with the Executive Director of the St. Lucia Social Development uh, Fund, the SSDF. And uh, on the, we, he was here on our last program and we spoke a lot about the purpose of the SSDF. Uh, but what we want to do right now is focus on a lot of your programs that are targeted at the youth, like the Our Boys program, mm -hmm. which you did uh, speak mm -hmm. on extensively on, our, on a previous program. So I wanted to just kind of summarize uh, the, uh, what the purpose of the Our Boys Matter program is. Yes, um, the Our Boys Matter program <coughs> was, is designed to assist um, boys who are poor and do not have the access to basic, basic resources, education resources. Um, at the end of the day, um, education is not just about creating a school and a school for that's that's good that's needed is necessary however there are resources that children need to go to school of course like books uniforms and what have you which um, ssdf has traditionally provided to to a number of families every year but um but of course through the uh, our boys matter program now we provide them with um the the the, the persons on obm with transportation, those that need transportation, mm -hmm. meals, some housing support and psychosocial support because there are times when there are issues in the families and what have you. So we provide them with that level of support, of course, CXCs and what have you. And in some cases, we send them to, to care. We send a number of students to care and, um, and that, that, that has worked out very well because um, a number of them now are working, uh, again, fully employed, because care has over 90% placement, employment placement. Mm -hmm. And we also um, have learned along the way that there is a need for um, what we call, um, what we call alternative pathways, because one of the things we found is that not, ev not all children are ideally suited to the structured nine to five type of workers um, school environment. I mean. Mm -hmm preparation for work environment and for them to sit in school like that in that structured way. So in some cases we, we would um, send them to NLU or NSDC where they could spend a shorter time learning a skill so they could be equipped with some, a skill so they can go into the workforce. So NLU, I'm unfamiliar with, with NLU. What National is? Learning Employment un in Unit. In, mm -hmm. yeah. So basically they provide training that's similar to NSDC, um, technical vocational training, auto mechanics, um, electrical work, and, you know, um, the, the hospitality and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, now there, you've mentioned a couple of things that I, I do want to address. Uh, how do boys qualify to get into the Our very, Boys Matter program? Very interesting. Um, initially, Initially, we asked the schools, the, the seven schools that were targeted in the pilot in the first instance, by the way, now we had all the secondary schools um, across, the, across the island, but initially it was seven schools in the north. And what we did, we asked the schools to provide names. For, we were targeted 100 boys, and so we asked the schools to provide names um, of the boys. I must say in some cases, some schools took the opportunity to try to provide names of students that they that will be in a nuisance, I guess, in the school. Um, in some ways, these were the persons that we were ideally targeting because I always said that um, OBM was ne not necessary for choir boys, but it was really for us to provide. There is a reason why some of these children were, were, were acting up. Uh, and a lot of times it was because they were just not interested in, in, what, in what was being taught. So, of course, they, they became the persons that would be distracting the classes and skipping school and behavioral issues and what have you. So yes, um, so, and we took a number of them um, we, and you know, and, and a lot of them were able to go through for the care program and, and, and graduate successfully. Mm -hmm. So it was important and it is important because the fact of the matter is we cannot turn our backs on the children that have behavioral issues at school. Mm -hmm. 
our challenge is to find ways to help them so they can graduate and become from whatever um, whatever their field of interest is for them so they can graduate and become productive citizens. If we, if we make the mistake of saying, okay, a child is behavioral, we have behavioral issues, we don't want to deal with them, we will deal with them later on in life. And the later could be very immediate too. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I agree with that. Um, is it an extensive problem locally where um, a lot of boys, a lot of our young men are dropping out of school? Well, absolutely. A lot of bo young boys are, are dropping out or they, they go to school infrequently. Um, I can tell you in the first instance, when we first started OBM, the attendance rate shot up tremendously for these children, the number of these children, those that have said went to care and those that stayed in the traditional secondary schools. So um, you, if, let's put it this way, if children are actively engaged in school, then that's less time for them to be involved in, in unde undesirable behaviors. So uh, the, one of the things here at the OBM does also is it provides in some cases lessons, after school lessons for children also. The thing is, that's one of the values of, of the after school programs, you know. I know the Ministry of Equity is heavily vested in after school programs. Because if you can get children actively involved in regular schools and your after school programs where they can get into sports and other things, meaningful things, maybe sports clubs and these things, then it keeps them engaged. Otherwise, I mean, when you have young children with a lot of energy, you know, they're not doing, just going to sit by and do nothing, you know. They get into a lot of things. And a lot of times they're unsupervised because um, unlike when, when I was growing up and you had two persons, two households, two, um, two, two parent families, um, a lot of children grew up in single parent homes. Uh -huh. So now you have a lot of times as a mother at work trying to provide Who's, 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 who's overseeing the kids after school, uh -huh. you know? So it's, it's, it plays a tricky role. And I mean, uh, all we have to do is look at the news at night to see what, you know, the, how the chickens come home, come home to roost. Uh -huh. um, now you mentioned after school programs. I know there's a, a program that the SSDF is in charge of, the, the Musical Bells program. Uh, could you speak a little bit about that? And do you, uh, on addition, in addition to that, um, ex try to, in your own opinion, tell me how, um, how important you think after school programs are to, to uh, young men or youth. And do you think music programs like music help the youth? Yes, um, actually, um, the, the, the musical bells program you talk about, um, that was really the brainchild of the Minister of Equity, Mr. Joachim Henry. Mm -hmm. And so he piloted, he's piloting that program in his constituency. Um, it is often said that music, a lot of children that are s strong in math have the aptitude for music. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting, you know, I know there's some studies done on that, that you know. And so um, I, for me, I think anything that can keep children actively engaged mm -hmm. in something that, that, you know, in some cases they can further develop but in something that is that is good and wholesome i think it is good um you talk about the after school programs i think they are critical most far more so now than in the days when you had two persons at home or grandmother a lot of children grew up with a grandmother at home i, I see you smiling because you know really a lot of children grew up with a grandmother if mom and dad were not home the granny was there or grandpa was there so um but now of course we don't have that you had you had the neighbors you know who were a critical part of a, a family unit and so even if the parents were not there i mean i remember when as a child i had to wait for for my neighbor miss daphne james to go so that you know <laughs> so that we could get out on the road and do things that we know you're not supposed to do when my parents are at work um so the after school programs provide some element well not some significant guidance you know for for children during the period of time when school is out and and their parents come home from work and so again some children are afforded opportunities to for additional lessons and some of them may be in sports and you know and, and some other areas of, of, of importance um, I will say in the same vein I think I think that um, I always lament the, the I call the death of a lot of sports clubs in St. Lucia because when I was growing up as a child, I mean, we had, you know, even, even we as, as I remember we formed an under-16 
our under 16 club to participate in the John Odlum under 16 tournament that was going on back in the time when I was young that was uh, that was football and um, we formed uh, uh, our club and we we had um, Charlie Brown who was a national player Trini very good coach he coached us you know and things like that mm -hmm. but there was discipline because um, you know a lot of times we got to the field and Charlie would say we're not touching a ball today you know we're going to do exercise we're going to do drills and stuff like that but you know as boys we want to play all of mm -hmm. us play but and if you didn't if you did not comply then you wouldn't play so there was this I always believe that uh, that um, if we could get find some way to bring back some of these clubs um, uh, these these clubs whether they be uniform clubs or you know football track and field and you name it cricket you know get get you we need to get our children engaged in in other activities so that they will not be have no, basically have nothing else but the recruitment into some of these 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 types of you know of of uh, undesirable behaviors mm -hmm. So now, I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. Now I also understand that you have uh, mentorship programs. Uh, there's, could could you speak a little bit about critical. that? Again, mentorship came out of OBM. Mm -hmm. um, one of the requirements for Massey stores when we first concepted was that, as I said, it had to be vulnerable boys and there had to be a strong mentorship component. But I will say to you that it is tremendously challenging to get male mentors. Um, the reality is this, and f from my perspective, eh, female mentors are readily available. However, most of these boys have access to mothers, probably grandmothers, oh, you, aunts, know, yeah. they, you know, aunts, you name it, you know, a lot of teachers are female. So a lot of the role models they see around them are female. Um, the, role, the, the role models they may see, the male, a lot of the male role models they would see would not be the type of roles that we'd want. So I felt, for me, I was very committed to finding male mentors. That has been tremendously challenging. I mean, you have somebody, you have Mr. Boo Hingson. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows Boo. And, you know, he's really, he's really the, 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 I mean, the poster child for, 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 for mentorship. You know his involvement with, the, with, with his mentees, you know, and what have you. Um, we've had training, we've had commitment from a number of persons that they will do it, and they come on board and they do the training. Very few of them stick the course, stay the course, and um, I think it's unfortunate uh, to the point where, um, I, from a couple of years ago, um, Miss Anthony and a few members of our team of, of the OBM team had asked for you know, wanted female mentors, but I was a little adamant that we should insist. I do not have a problem with us having female mentors, but I think it is critical that young boys see males doing positive things. And so I was, I was very, a little, I was a little bit stubborn about it. And I'm, I'm still hopeful that we can find some way to, to engage. Um, I, I, I know they're out there, we just have to reach them so that we can provide that level of support um, in addition to you know female mentors but first of all male mentors because I, I have heard sayings that it takes a man to raise a man not to not to take anything away from single mothers yes they do a lot of them do a very yes. good job but yes. it's it's a lot easier mm -hmm. and from my own experience if you have a male role model to kind of mentor you or father you or what or what have you that is critical um, I think I think I was I, I say all the time nobody told us as children, my brothers, myself, that we had to go out and work to take oh, care. Sorry, um, there's a, um let me just um stop you right there. We do for a break and we'll be we'll come right back to what you were talking about just now. Mm -hmm. You're watching okay. Issues and Answers. I noticed Please that you it. built your Please retaining stay. wall on my property. You will have to give me my land back or compensate me for that. My contractor isn't dumb. I trust that he will not build anything on your property. Where is your proof? Let's go to court. This situation does not require you to go to court. Looks like we have to go through mediation here. Mediation is a way people resolve conflicts like this. Someone, a third party, comes to speak to both parties. This person is called the mediator. The mediator is impartial. He or she makes sure that communication between both parties is effective and efficient. So, the mediator is a judge? 
No, the mediator is not a judge. Mediators, unlike judges, do not decide cases or impose settlements. Let me get a mediator to handle this retaining wall and that kitchen. Kitchen? Yes, your kitchen also falls on my land. Let me call the mediator. Yes, we're back. You're watching Issues and Answers. We're here with SSDF Executive Director, Mr. Dr. Allison Mather, and we're talking about, well, before we left, we were talking about mentorship, mentorship of young men. Yes, yes I was saying, um, so nobody had to tell us that we had to go out and provide for our families, take care of our children and things like that. But unfortunately, our boy, our, our young males do not learn that lesson now. And, and the big reason is that nobody had to tell us because we saw it. Mm -hmm. We saw it in our affair. I saw it in my father, my neighbors, my, you know, my friends' fathers. Mm -hmm. and that was the rule. Granted, fathers didn't show a whole lot of love back then. A lot of them didn't. The discipline. But we knew. We knew they provided for us. And, we, and certainly I knew at my home that there were serious consequences uh, for, 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 you know, what you call bad behavior. Mm -hmm. So, but... And that is absent now, so the role of a mentor now becomes critical because these young men, so, and I could see, you could see, I, I can tell you with the example of Boo's mentor, one of the mentees of Boo, I mean, this was a young man that was really, really troublesome. Mm -hmm. I, I, I had, to tell you the truth, I had gone to the point where I felt like that boy should not be in the program. He was at care at the time. Um, he in particular was released care. Care didn't want to have anything to do with him. Mm -hmm. And then Miss Anthony and Boo, Mm -hmm. um, work, continued to work with him and um, Miss Anthony got him into an alternative thing where he went to an apprenticeship thing with a garage and, um, and he was subsequently, he subsequently re-entered care. Mm -hmm. You know, so the, the point I want to make is that, um, that again, without, without um, Boo's mentorship, you know, that young man would have been born a long time ago. Oh. And so, so we, have some of these, we have some of these examples with the mentors. There's no doubt in my mind that mentorship will be successful, would, su would su successfully assist a lot of these young men transitioning. Mm -hmm. But the problem is finding the male mentors. Mm -hmm. Now you have uh, two other programs that I want to talk about. You have uh, the Adolescent Development Program as well as the Educational Assistance Program. Could you talk about both of those? Well, the Adolescent Development Program is a care program. It's a program that's conducted by care. It's almost akin to PET, personal mm -hmm. enhancement training. And the, one of the requirements for care is that they must do the ADP, what they call the ADP. That program, they must do it for about, I think it's a year long before mm -hmm. they, they start to get into some of the technical, some of the technical vocational training. Um, although I believe that it could be done in conjunction with it rather than after the fact, but um, but it's a very very good program. Um, I can tell you, even um, from from some of our experiences with the BNTA program, where where um, students learn did pet training or the ADP pro training, they they would single out that as one of the main reasons for them staying the course of one of these programs because you teach them conflict resolution. One, one lady gave a testimon testimonial and said that she was always fighting in her community and this mm -hmm. and that. And then when the sewing, she was doing sewing, one of the initiatives we had was sewing, and she said that, um, you know, her mother didn't know what to do with her and what have you, and after she did the pet, pet training, mm -hmm. she said that, you know, it, it really changed her thinking and her approach and that she was a better person for it. So it is a critical thing. As a matter of fact, I, I wonder of often why some of these programs are not taught at the school level, you mm -hmm. know. Um, a very good ADP type, type program should be taught at the school level because you know in schools you have all kind of conflicts, fighting, children fighting and all kinds of things mm -hmm. like that. Um, so I think it would help a lot, but it certainly helps get these, these children rounded in, in you know, in, how they should behave in, in schools and that sort of thing, and, and it, it helps to predict their success. Mm -hmm. I also understand that you had some, as you mentioned, care. you had some, you conducted some work with the 2022 graduating class of care. Could you well, speak a little bit about that? Well, let me just put it in perspective. They were our boys' matter students. Mm -hmm. So they were 
every every year K graduate students, mm -hmm. we have some OBM students as part of it. Um, two years ago, one of the boys gave a, 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 a testimonial. He he had to speak on it, and he, he he and he spoke about the fact that he didn't know what would happen to him if the OBM program had not come on board and he had not been given the opportunity to go to K, you know, and stuff. So, you know, he was very thankful because the road he was going down was not a good one at the time, you know. So similarly, last year, um, this year we had, we had some of the boys, our boys graduate um, from K, you know, and that's what happens. A lot of our boys that go to K graduate from K. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wish that we could send more boys to K. I just wish that there'd be more K type institutions so that we can take care of the number of children that have the aptitude and interest in the technical vocational training. Because mm -hmm. yes, as you, as you mentioned that, because K has a lot of, in lieu of young boys being, um, I guess, showing more aptitude for the academics, you mm -hmm. have uh, auto mechanics, carpentry, mm -hmm. joinery skills. Electro electrical mm -hmm. training. And I'll say this to you. Um, very good program because a lot of the boys went by the time they go to do their apprenticeship training before they graduate and a number of them have already secured employment you know mm. and i mean to me that's one of my attractions to that to the program you know because um one of the things about technical vocational training it lends itself easier to self-employment you know if you learn plumbing at school I mean, what does it take for you to wake them up to be the plumber in your community when you graduate. Mm -hmm. What does it take for you to be, you know, you know, fix vehicles as a, you know, whether you go and work for a little somebody, a shop, or you set up your own thing, you know. So there are opportunities for for them to for self employment, you mm -hmm. know, and they come out from they come out from school, they graduate from school ready for work. That is critical. Mm -hmm. The same cannot be said for persons that go the theoretical theoretical route. Because what we're doing is we're preparing them for, for university, mm -hmm. but which is, which is not bad. I'm not saying it's bad. For those that do not make it to university and they end up going to have to go to work, yeah. then it becomes essentially, it's almost like they're coming out of, of, of school without any ready-to-work skills, mm -hmm. unlike the, uh, the, the technical vocation. Mm -hmm. yes. Now, on our last program, there were some things that you were discussing we never got a chance to to finish Res talking about. Resource mobilization. Mm -hmm. um, I was making the point um, and I was speaking and it's sad COVID came up because right at the time when we were really moving into full gear in, in terms of setting up a thrift shop, um, I was saying the idea was is that we would, based on the memorandum of understanding that signed between the SSDF and the USLOE, is that the SSDF would set up a, a shop type structure, a store type structure and uh, from the free countries, uh, the USLOA under the umbrella would send goods, um, stuff to St. Lucia that would be sold at the, in, the th in the thrift store. And the proceeds of that would, there is a ster steering committee that would be set up to govern the, the, the operation of the St. Lucia U USLOA Association. And um, the steering committee could comprise of members of the USLOA and of the SSDF board and, and, and management. And together, collectively, they would decide what initiatives they would undertake with the proceeds. Our challenge was finding a suitable location. Um, upstairs the SSDF, there is space, but it would take too much money. It would be very costly to rent a retrofit that. And, and, you know, and ideally, the other thing is ideally you want to be close to the town so you have walking traffic and others. So we still we still challenged by that. Um, the 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 plan is to even to seek some assistance from our diaspora partners to see if they can assist us in in getting set up. It would be nice if we had a factory shell or something where we could do that. But we still uh, look. There were persons in um in in Saint Croix, the Saint Croix Association, that were ready to go. Containers, they prepared to send stuff. Uh, but notwithstanding that, we've we still, even during the COVID time, we got some assistance from the diaspora. And some people just heard about the SSDF through the diaspora, and they would reach out. There was, um, there was a small group in the UK that sent some microscopes, very expensive mi microscopes for schools in St. Lucia. So we continue to get 
wheelchairs and you know other things like that pampers and you know school supplies and, and stuff from the diaspora the diaspora is a largely untapped resource mm -hmm. there are numbers and Lucians that live overseas and they want to help and the biggest ch challenge for a lot of them is it is not organized so the SSDF now that's why they were very happy that the SSDF there is an SSDF around because now they can there is a source where they can send the, the, the stuff and they would know that it's going to what is it intended because there's also as you would appreciate some elements of fraud where people ask the the diaspora partners for goods for certain things and that's not what they want to use it for and all kinds of things like that uh -huh. so um, in terms you had mentioned about educational assistance and um, well, the SSDF um, from as far back as the PRFDs that I th that's probably the oldest SSDF program is educational assistance uh -huh. and um, understandably so because I mean we help over 3,000 ch children a year to be able to go back to school books uniform shoes and uh, now even in some cases transportation and what have you and uh, the sad thing is that we cannot help everybody so for example under under the SSDF regular program um, we wouldn't help more than two persons in a, in, a, in a household so if a mother has five kids we can only help two what happens to the other the three you know and things like that so but education is expensive books are very expensive and uh, and so that is the challenge again for government because I still believe that um, I don't really I don't see that we have a choice in terms of ensuring that that um, that our that children have the means to go to school and they can stay in school because they're not hungry you know they're not at school you know thinking that they don't have food seeing that they had a call you know it, it just doesn't make sense we must find a way I know it's going to be costly but like I say the cost of not doing it is just far too great because a lot of kids that could have gone on to become you know productive citizens they end up a lot of them end up dead and you know others end up in a lot in, in other bad situations that is that is very true um, we've come to the end of our program I want to thank you very much for coming. I hope you can come again to talk about the good work at the SSDF. Uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Mather, for coming on. Thanks for the opportunity, and thanks for the opportunity to, to speak on the programs at the SSDF. Thank you. And thank you. You're watching Issues and Answers, a production of the Government Information Service. I'm your host, Jacques Kingston Compton. Please stay tuned to the National Television Network and a lot of our other programming can be available on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel.